Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Y'all ready? ready? Welcome to the Upside Down Smiley Show where we talk about real life but we don't take life too seriously and we hear the stories of everyday people. My name is Shireen and today we're going to talk about microaggressions. Cue the intro. met Divya yesterday and we're here recording in the bathroom <laughs> in the bathroom and she has a brick wall in her apartment so it's just brick out it was just fake <laughs> <laughs> we like met yesterday and we started talking about my show and um, she started talking about the kind of work that you do and we started talking about microaggressions and I was like hmm I need to google that so tell us like what that means sure so you know, hearing terms like microaggressions are super, super trendy right now to yeah. know the definitions, but what I think is interesting is the sort of mental health background of these terms. Yeah. So to give you a little bit of background, I'm a psychiatrist. I work with children and adults, and I just moved to New York um, to finish my training in child psychiatry. And I do a lot of work specifically with immigrants and also with the legal system and asylum. So I'm working a lot with people who come to me who are experiencing microaggressions, overt acts of racism, um, and certain kinds of disparities in the community that actually lead them to have mental health problems. I don't know if you've had this experience before, but you know, usually this is how it goes for me. Someone might walk up to me and be like, you know, that guy's cute for an Indian guy. Yeah. And I'm like, for an Indian guy? Okay. Like, why, do, why is that like necessary for you to say? And I think one thing also is, can you explain to people like what overt Mm -hmm. racism is because I don't think people really understand. I think a lot of times when people hear the word racist or racism, they're just like scared of the word mm -hmm. because they're like, I'm not a racist. Like I don't, I don't treat people poorly. I have a black friend. I got a black friend. <laughs> I got one black friend. I got one brown friend. Like, but when I see groups of like all white people, I'm like, y'all don't know one just person of color. Just one person of color. <laughs> Like, or if you do, like, what is that? Does that mean? No, yeah, like, say anything that's, that's not enough either, right? So yeah. what is overt racism? So overt, overt racism is basically if you walk up to someone and you, let's say you walk up to a brown person and you literally say, I hate brown people, you don't deserve to be in this country. And that's overt because I think you could walk up to most people and they would say that that is very offensive yeah. and racist and there isn't really like a questioning aspect around it. Yeah. Um, whereas an indirect act of racism, you know, from what hearing the word indirect, yeah. it means that it's like not fully clear, right? Yeah. So a lot of times growing up, I grew up in a suburban part of Texas, of Houston, where I was one of the few brown people there. Yeah. And a lot of times people would say things to me and I'd go home, my parents would be like, well, it's okay because, you know, like, Michael didn't mean it. They yeah. didn't mean it that way. <laughs> and right? Like, oh, it's all innocent, like it's not a big deal. Like, or like, they don't know better. Mm-hmm. Stop it. And then that's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stop it. And you're like, Why people have so much education? <laughs> like. They know better. There's people, Google. People know better. Yeah. You can look it up. <laughs> right. Um, so basically, the word microaggression, and microaggression is one of many different indirect acts of racism. Okay. Microaggression is one of them, and yeah. you know, there's other ones. We'll have other episodes about those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and basically, it was coined by a black psychiatrist. Okay. In is it like a recent term? No, it came out in the 1970s. Okay, mm -hmm. and it's been very popular, I feel like, recently. Yeah, I feel like it's more, so it's gone through various iterations as they've, as they've done like psych psychological and social, like sociology research about the topic. Yeah. But um, it was coined by a black psychiatrist who went to Harvard named Chester Pierce. Okay. And he actually was the mentor, one of my mentors. Okay. And so she told me the story. Yeah. Um, and he was on the Harvard football team and he, Basically, long story short, there was all this drama about him going to like another play another team in the South that you know they didn't want to play a team with a black person. Okay. That's an example of overt racism. Yeah. He gets on the plane. You know, if they finally agree, he gets on the plane and somebody sits next to him, and then at some point somebody else gets on the plane and basically opens up a seat so the person next to him could move seats, and he spent the rest of the plane ride wondering. Did she move seats because like that seat was better for her and there was more space or yeah. because I'm black? Yeah. And that's a microaggression. I feel like this shows up in our lives as South Asians all the time and then I also like see it happen. I think a lot of times you don't know for sure, right? You don't mm -hmm. know for sure if the reason why 
they did that is because of just like coincidence or because they it was just a preference mm -hmm. thing but as people of color we we think about it right my brother-in-law was talking about like a person of color sitting on the bus mm -hmm. will likely um like a, a white person will likely have a, a seat partner mm -hmm. over a person of color that's that's a microaggression right? yeah like you're not you're not doing that like intentionally right you, but you but people feel safer sitting next to a white person. Probably more often than not. Yeah. But I think the thing, so I'm gonna get on my laptop to give you the exact <laughs> definition. So, yeah. Because I think it's important. She's, so, she's got a slide that says wolf words. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's for another presentation. Um, oh, it took the lighting off of us. No, uh, yeah, you're good. <laughs> um, so the point of a microaggression being so harmful is actually irrelevant. It's irrelevant whether the person meant it or not. Yeah. What's relevant because right, wondering if the other person meant it is making it about them yeah. and not even about you. Yeah. So what actually makes microaggression so harmful is that we, the ones who are experiencing it, we don't know whether the person meant it or not and then we spend all this time ruminating. Yeah. And if you are having microaggressions happening to you every day or as Chester Pierce called it, infringing on a person's time, space, energy and mobility over and over again, then you're losing time and you're you're losing mobility in the world. Yeah. And if you're experiencing this every single day, that's what leads to the negative health effects. And yeah. actually the research shows that chronic microaggressions, chronic racism, especially like people who um, are coming, crossing the border who come here who are afraid of being targeted in both indirect and direct ways, that leads to not only mental health problems, but yeah. also physical health problems. Yeah. Because it changes our behavior. So it's really, like the point that I think is important is, is that we need to realize that it's not about, oh, he didn't mean it, so it's okay. It's why, what did this microaggression make me experience yeah. that made me spend all this time wondering like if it was me, if it was them, and what does that do to my self-esteem yeah. and my behaviors? There's a lot of situations where I just feel like I feel invisible because I'm treated in a way that makes me feel invisible. And, and it's usually in situations, it's 100% in situations where white people make me feel invisible. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then you wonder, like, is it me? Is it you? Like, is it because I'm short? Is yeah. it because I'm brown? Is it because I'm a female? Is it because you think that I can't or like deliver anything to the world? Like, for me, it's often like because I grew up with a lot of microaggressions when I was younger, and almost yeah. to the point where it was like I was just used to it. Yeah, because like, if I was offended by it, everyone would be like, "Why are you overreacting?" Right. So then I would think of a reaction. I would why I would be like, "Oh, I must be too sensitive. Like yeah. maybe I'm being too picky." We're we're being angry, angry yeah, and girls. Yeah, Yesterday, angry, angry brown girls. <laughs> angry brown girls. Like, wasn't there a guy that like was kind of giving a shit yesterday? Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, okay. Like, why well, won't you smile? It's like because I'm smizing, you know. Right. I'm trying to keep keep this clear. <laughs> I'm not trying to get any lines. Just stop smiling. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna be expressionless the rest of the video. Yeah, it's just a shitty thing that happens all the time yeah. and causes health problems. Yeah. And, lots of other problems, so what do we really do about it? And how can we have a conversation around it? So I think my first point is that I wanted to explain like what a microaggression was in terms of causing a person to ruminate being the problem about it, so that when you're experiencing it, you'll realize like that's what's happening to everybody, mm -hmm. and that there's some comfort in that space of like, okay, this kind of makes everyone go crazy, and it isn't just me, that's what yeah. this is. Like yeah. that is what the process is. Right, right, right. That is, exa that is the definition of the term. Yeah, and I think that's different for then accepting it because it's they didn't mean it yeah because yeah. that's not the point and yeah that brings me to my next point actually so a lot of times what happens um there's this this therapist i really like that discuss has a transcript online about this but basically he talks about how well then when somebody says like let's say i'm a white person and i say like something offensive to you and then i go oh what i didn't mean it like you know i didn't mean that yeah then it becomes about you having to console me yeah which is like Basically, you end up having to console a perpetrator. Yeah. And the person who's being oppressed, it, there's no space for them. Yeah. And I think the point is there. At that point, the conversation needs to be like, you might ask to clarify like why they said it, but yeah, the chances are they don't even know what yeah. they said. They're just gonna be like, I didn't mean it. Right. It was like, well, probably something 
but unconscious implicit bias. Yeah. yeah, which we can have another, you know. Yeah. Um, but basically, the point is, is that the person who has been oppressed is experiencing a lot of discomfort. Yeah. The person who is afraid that they offended somebody is also experiencing discomfort. But it is not the same amount of discomfort that the person who has to experience the microaggressions every day is experiencing. And the point is, is that the discomfort is inevitable. Mm -hmm. So the what I would advise to do there would actually to be like, A, if, if you're the person receiving the microaggression, A, is it somebody that is worth confronting for yes. you? Is it someone like close into your yeah. life? Like you mm -hmm. care about the relationship? Is it is it like something that's bothering me that much or is it someone that's worth confronting that is it's important to you and that it's gonna be worth the mental effort it takes to do the confrontation? Yeah. And then when that shit's exhausting. It is exhausting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well am I gonna get more exhausted thinking about it or is do do I think I can have a productive conversation? Yeah. Then the next thing would be just you could you should say, like when you said that it offended me because it felt like blah blah blah. And yeah. using I feel statements is really good. Yeah. And then the other person might say, predictably, like, well, you know I didn't mean it, like, I feel really bad, I'm sorry, but like, you know I didn't mean that, that's not like me, that's not, that's not who I am. You know Do you that. feel like that's a productive way to respond? No. Okay. I think that is the response that's like realistically gonna happen though. Yeah. Like given mm -hmm. like nine times out of ten. Because like, there I are... love Indian weddings. There is amazing. <laughs> Arranged marriage is fascinating, you know. Like, and I think it's like this feeling of you have to defend yourself, right? being just defensive mm -hmm. and um wanting to clarify but i think you have to listen yeah so, listening is hard. yeah like you have to listen without and actively listen instead mm -hmm. of like listening and trying to think of what your response is going to be exactly and i think so so let's say the person says um i didn't mean it blah 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 then I would recommend that you could say something like, you know, as I said before, you, when you said that it made me feel blah, 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 but say, you know, whether you meant it or not is actually not, is not what's important here. What's important is that what you said offended me or hurt my feelings. Yeah. And like, this is how I would like it to be done in the future. Yeah. Or you could say something like, you know, I know that this is uncomfortable for you because I feel like you you like you are feeling bad now that you might be coming off as racist right but that's not relevant and in order for us to have these conversations you're supposed to feel uncomfortable so if you're not feeling if the if the white person is not feeling uncomfortable yeah something is not being done right like if they feel like really confident in the fact that they didn't do anything wrong which i think is sometimes mm -hmm. the the reality yeah of like very entitled and um believing that what they did wasn't wrong and you are conjuring something in your head mm -hmm. is oftentimes how I feel. It's not about you. Exactly. I've noticed in my own personal experiences if I confront and say like, you know what, you're kind of supposed to feel uncomfortable here mm -hmm. because you know, you did say something offensive and it did offend me, but it's okay that you feel uncomfortable. I just want you to learn from this and like go go to Google and look at <laughs> right it. because like the only way that we're gonna better ourselves is by being more honest. How can you be honest without uncomfortable conversations? Yeah. Most people yeah. like avoid conversations and like they let things go and then sometimes it'll boil up or it'll come up again. When you are a person of color or any type of marginalized population, um, whether that's like your gender identity or your sexuality or your socioeconomic status or whatever, whatever way that you don't really fit in yeah or that you were historically or currently oppressed um, basically you have been used to being uncomfortable yeah your whole life. Like, we're so, I, I'm used to it so for we me we walk like, into rooms of like all white people and we're used to it so it's like I don't feel bad so some people might say well white people in America and some in my white community like didn't they don't they didn't learn that from a young age so like it's not their fault because they don't know any better but I think that even if that is true or not true, that's again irrelevant. It's like, well, you're gonna feel uncomfortable and I'm gonna point it out and you're gonna continue to feel uncomfortable and that's okay. So I've been dating a white guy for like, I don't even know, many years now. Yeah. And learning about this stuff for me has been so beneficial to our relationship. Yeah. And important to process in any yeah. in any relationship. And he's a have. great guy. I just met him. He's over there. And he's he's listening <laughs> at the window. Um, and he, uh, I feel like you know when you meet a white person and they're just like, you know they're woke. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he was always like that, but like my brother's girlfriend, like she's woke. Like she's she knows, she understands her privilege. She she understands that she doesn't know how we feel, and she just listens. Mm -hmm. You know, active listening. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so you can be a woke white person as well. And I think you know the takeaway is discomfort is good. Yeah, discomfort is good. Now you know why. You, what's bad about microaggressions? The ruminating and yeah. There's always Google. Just Google it. That's how I learned yeah. about microaggressions. Ask so. Bing. <laughs> <laughs> Who uses Bing? <laughs> Thank you. No, seriously, my hospital, you, like, it goes to Ask Bing first. Or Ask Jeeves, maybe. No, stop it. No, that was from, like, middle school. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Um, yeah, no, I feel like I, I hope this is productive. I honestly want to, like, continue this conversation because I don't feel, like, super informed by it. Um, and I think it's important to get people that do work in this um industry and have like scientific knowledge and i appreciate that and i literally met her yesterday in the bathroom and i'm just slashy summit slashy summit shout out and she's got this um little dope little brown girl sweater she got some cute earrings she's so dope um thank you so much for watching uh comment below let me know what you guys think and yeah any questions that you guys have yeah i'd love to continue to answer yeah, I'll tag her so you guys know where to follow her and you can check out her poetry. Oh yeah, I write poetry. Yeah. Some of it is um, related to race, some not. Right, right, yeah, so dope. Thank you guys, bye.